Welcome everyone. Here we are at the Peace and Justice Studies Association Annual Conference. I'm Amanda Smith Byron. I'm a board member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, which is an academic association that focuses on work in peace and justice studies. And uh, our annual conference has gone for three months this year. We started in September, uh, focusing on restorative justice. October was focused on narrative and storytelling, and November we're focusing on polarization. If you're a member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, you can still access all of our presentations online, and you do that through the membership portal uh, on the website. So thank you all for joining us today, and this is our final day of the conference. We'll be ending after the session with a keynote presentation at four o'clock with Brandon Brown, who's an incarcerated scholar who is working in the area of peace and justice studies. So we're looking forward to a wonderful closing keynote at seven o'clock Eastern. So uh, to kick things off, I would just like to turn things over to Chip House, who will be introducing the session and introducing the panel. So thank you all for being here. And thank you, Chip, for getting us started. OK, and uh, I'm Chip House, and I work part time at the Alliance for Peace Building and at George Mason University's Carter School uh, for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And that's Gretchen Sandals behind me. We haven't figured out how to make our my office look good for two people, but we do most of our work together. And we find ourselves in this session sandwiched between a session yesterday. I'm going to read this because the title is so great. Storytelling exclamation point. Grumpy old women, turtles, frogs, locusts, and other unlikely heroes. And will be followed, as Amanda said, by our, one of our new PhD students, Brandon Brown, who I didn't know had was an incarcerated uh, person and in fact earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Maine at Augusta, which is about 20 miles from where I used to live until I moved to Washington. But, but we've taken on a, a more prosaic task that I in fact made even more prosaic with the title that I sent to um, the PJSA folks um, six months ago. And that is what I want us to figure out is how we can use constructive stories about what's going on in the world. And I will be very brief in doing that on my end before turning over to the others. And it's my hope that in the course of the next hour and a half or so, we can surface some ideas that you can take back to whatever it is that you do, wherever it is that, that you live. Um, but before I dig into that, let's do some logistics. If you, I would appreciate it if you keep your screen going. Um, I like to see the people I'm talking to. Uh, if you want to rename yourself, feel free. In fact, if your name is not suggesting who you are and where you're from, that might be a good idea. Um, as Michael has already demonstrated, kids, pets, and food are, are, are welcome and uh, mute is appreciated. And um, when, we, when we get through the, the presentations, which will take about 20 minutes uh, or so, then we'll go into an open discussion. And I assume you've all used Zoom enough to know how to raise your hand in the participant section and we'll try to figure out a, best, a, a good way of handling that. Um, before I open the, the, the discussion though, I want to get to know who the people are in the room. And I have a friend that I don't think any of you know other than Gretchen, Lynn Wells, who was an assistant secretary of defense for many years. And Lynn, when asked to give an introduction, could talk for 15 minutes. And, that, and when you get three people who do that, that kills an entire session. So one day I was listening to NPR and Michelle Norris did this idea of six word race stories, which were really terrific. And so I co-opted that into six word introductions. So let's go around the room and we can do it in whatever order you want. I'm now only seeing myself. If we can avoid that so I can actually see everyone, that would be nice. But six words of introduction. You can tell yourself, tell me who you are, that doesn't count 
where you are, that doesn't count, but your description is six words only. And so mine is, I collect interesting people, which is four words. And I give the other two to Gretchen who gets eight. <laughs> and I'm a part-time uh, uh, peace builder and activist, uh, a full-time grandmother. And so I'm just, why don't I just go down this? Abby, why don't you go next? You're next on my list. Sure. Hi, I'm Abby Rappaport. I'm the publisher of Stranger's Guide, uh, currently in Virginia, normally in Texas. Um, Storytelling, story telling, wait, I'm terrible at this. Don't count those words. Um, <laughs> I love hearing powerful stories. How's that? Five, so one under. So Chloe, who is next on my list, you get it seven words. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Chloe. Um, I'm currently in Chicago. Sorry, my camera is off. I'm traveling right now a little bit. So um, my short description would be I'm a current Georgetown student. Okay, and John Getz. John, you're muted, so you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Hi, I'm, a I'm John Getz, a retired prof of American Lit at Xavier University in Cincinnati. And in my teaching and scholarship, I've been interested in the intersections of peace studies and literature. Cool. Kate? Hi, I'm Kate Mitty. I'm in Boston and with Build Up on this. and. I'm really interested in what long-term, what is long-term care for the consciousness of our society? And oh, Steve, uh, and next I have Steve. I'm not gonna try your, your Chinese name, Shi oh. Shui. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there's an MD student at uh, Boston University. Uh, uh, School of Theology and uh, as a first year and uh, uh, I'm uh, speaking from Boston and I'm living on just off the uh, campus and uh, 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 I hope, hope to learn from you, all of you guys in this, uh, in this conference. Thank you. Yeah. And Naomi? Hi, I'm Naomi Cranebring. Uh, I live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I'm a PhD student at George Mason, uh, first year. <laughs> and um, I'm a mom of four and uh, interested in conflict and religion with a historic peace church flavor. Ah, you and I need to talk. We'll, and we'll start that now. Thon? Hi, I'm Tan. Um, I live sorry. I live in Portland, Oregon. Amanda is my uh, professor, uh -huh. and I'm a cultured conflict resolution student, cultured student from Portland. And Tim, and finally, after Tim, Tony. Tim, you're here twice, it seems. Tim, you're muted. Okay, is that good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, my, my computer finally started working. I'm Tim Reese, I'm a saxophonist and composer living in New York and today I'm in my house in New Jersey, but um, I guess my six words, I, inclusion, communication, dialogue, peace, music and love. I, and finally, Tony. I'm Tony Ferris. I'm a PhD student at George Mason, and um, I live in Texas. These six words. I'm a mom, um, student, always uh, mindfulness, yoga, hippie, and peacemaker. Okay, so now, after 11 minutes of dawdling, I'll try to set up what I hope we we can accomplish now. And I decided this morning that 
the last time we tried to do this, one of the, the participants felt it wasn't structured enough. So that led me to do a PowerPoint. So if Amanda, if you can let me share my screen. And I did not succeed in doing a PowerPoint. My goal has been to do a PowerPoint that has no words of my own in it. I almost succeeded. So about 30 years ago, I was at a conference put on by the Beyond War Movement in California, and they sent us this topic, reality tells me what to do. And I assumed that was going to be some, some silly little thing. And we spent three very intense days covering everything from the end of the Cold War to how our personal lives were changing. And it had such an impact on me that I go back to it every once in a while, whenever something weird happens. And about this time last year, I published an introductory textbook in Peace and Conflict Studies, which I knew would be out of date the minute I sent it to the publisher. Then we had 2020 happen and it was hopelessly out of date. And so I decided I should update the last chapters, which talked about the need to build a movement and the need to turn leadership over to young people. Five pages turned into 50, and it got me to a conclusion that, that I call the peace building pivot, um, because I spent a lot of time in the startup world. How, you know, how do we, like a startup company, pivot to face the world that we live in today? I was fortunate enough to attend the first meeting of what was then the Peace Studies Association, which I think was at Brandeis. It was at Brandeis, and I think it was in 1988, so at about the same time. And a wonderful man named George Lopez gave the presidential address, and he talked about our field being doom and gloom 101. And I had this kind of oh shit experience and, and realized that's in fact what I was doing in my classes. I was teaching only about problems, not about solutions. And I'm shifted my own teaching at that point um, and have really thought about constructive things primarily ever since. But this year has been hard. On March 12th, I went downstairs to watch the Michigan basketball game in the Big Ten tournament, men's basketball, and um, discovered that the pandemic had hit. There was no more basketball, and we all know what we've lived through since. We've had a recession in which it could be as many as 20 million people will lose their homes in the next six weeks to two months. We've seen the the renewal of racist, uh, anti-racist activity with Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington and elsewhere. And of course, we've had this little thing called an election that we've had to deal with. And I just got quite depressed, began thinking about reality tells me what to do. And then the Oberlin Alumni Magazine arrived in my uh, mailbox one day and the cover was a statement from an English professor who I didn't know says, we don't get to choose when we were born. We don't choose what natural disasters, epidemiological emergencies, stock market crashes, tyrannical regimes, or wars are our generations face. We only get to choose how we react. And it was a hell of an email to send to your students and a hell of a thing for the college to put on its alumni magazine. And I've had some discussions with Wendy since but what I realized is that we're dealing with what I call wicked problems, whose causes and consequences are so inextricably interconnected, you can't solve them separately, easily, quickly, if you can solve them at all. And here's where, for this audience, I might be a little controversial. And that is the solutions to wicked problems from where I sit involve collaborative solutions, cooperative solutions, and then somehow I don't know where this cartoon came from, but it, it looks to me like those little figures are all smiling, although they don't have faces. And they're, they're protesting, but they're also saying we. And how do we expand the we that we work with? And I'm also drawn to the Institute for Economics and Peace, which puts out the Positive Peace Index. And they talk about virtuous cycles. They talk about systems in general, and they end up 
talking about the intersection of the economy and peace, that if you can't solve basic economic problems, which we now add racial and public health and environmental and so on, the vicious cycle can never become virtuous. And so I've really been focusing on how we build coalitions with people who work on other issues. As a global peace studies scholar, uh, I've mostly worked on places other than the US. And when I look at our success stories, they've been in places where we've organized around peace, but also peace with a different issue as well. Race in South Africa being the most obvious example. So I've been hanging around with people who focus on economic issues, perhaps because I got a C plus in the only economics course I ever took, and I have no idea how I did that well. But one of the groups I've been working with is a group called Imperative 21, who, as the slide says, it's time to reset capitalism, that this, the fundamental capitalist system under a world of wicked problems isn't working very well. And so they talk about the need to design for the future around issues like climate, invest um, in unmet resources, and finally, to include all stakeholders. And you can't do those things unless you really talk to all the kinds of people who have been showing up in the streets of late. I've also spent some time with a, an edgier group called Zebras Unite, which is actually Amanda headquarters, at least one of its headquarters is in Portland. It's a group of really edgy startups who really want to run their companies the way Kate and her colleagues run build up in, in ways that will not talk the way Imperative 21 does to Wall Street, but we'll talk to bi local businesses in communities. And finally, it seems to me that, again, I hang around a lot with people who, who are in the startup world who always talk about going to scale. And to, for them, scale usually means how we build upward, how we grow the size of our company, how we go from Airbnb being three guys with air mattresses to being the biggest hotel chain in the world in the span of six years. But there's more. If, if peace building is what we talk about, we also have to build, as I've been saying, outward. We have to build into other communities because peace building is not going to be the issue that grabs people's attention in the next decade going forward, as far as I can see. And finally, and I've picked this up from from Kate and from Abby and from Tim, um, and now Tony, who I'm just getting to know, the need for us to change inwardly as well. We need to, in some sense, go to scale by becoming more self-aware as people. So I'm now done sharing my screen so we can get rid of, I have to do that, I guess. Um, and so at this point, it's time for me, um, to shut up and turn the table over to four people I have the pleasure of working with, who I'll now introduce, who are trying to do all of those kinds of scaling, but especially scaling out from the traditional peace building community that I've been a part of for half a century. And so I think we'll do it in this order. So Abby Rappaport, as she said, runs Stranger Sky. I've actually known Abby virtually her entire life. Um, her father and I went to college and her father, mother, my wife and I all went to graduate school together. But Abby has this incredible magazine that is designed for young hip travelers telling the stories of what travel can be like. But it's also, as we're thinking of it, going to become an educational tool. Um, Abby is probably the farthest of us all from traditional peace building. Second is Tim Reese, who I know through someone I've known even longer than Abby's parents. But Tim, I, I it's hard to describe what Tim does, but he's been a jazz saxophonist and composer since he graduated from the University of Michigan. The easiest way to describe him is he no longer has a day job 
as a touring saxophonist for the Rolling Stones because no one is touring. And Tim has always been interested in how we can use music and the arts in general to help build support for peace in refugee camps and elsewhere. Um, we met, Gretchen and I met Tony Farris about a year ago when she was applying to George Mason's PhD program. And I, of course, tried to talk her out of it because I'm not sure why anyone would want to get a PhD these days. But she's really interested in something else that I don't do, but Gretchen does, which is to look at the role of yoga, embodied practice, spirituality in building um, toward a more peaceful society. And even though everyone in my family does yoga other than my 98 year old mother and me, I haven't gotten there yet. So I'm still learning. And finally, Kate Mitty, who is closest to what I think of as traditional peace building, works for a group called Build Up, which puts on the annual Build Peace Conference, which brings together mostly young people plus me who work on peace building, technology, and the arts. And I'm privileged to be on their board and I get to learn from these wonderful young people about what it really means to run a peace building organization with the values that they phrase as among other things. How do we be non-neutral and non-polarizing? So I've asked them each to talk for five minutes and then we'll use the rest of the time to talk amongst ourselves in ways that I cannot predict. So Abby, the virtual floor is- I was just gonna here. ask you very quickly, would you mind if I went second? There is just in, this, in the spirit of, of complete candor, there is a, a mile not happening downstairs. And if I could just pop out for one sec, I'll, I'll be back in about 30 seconds. All right. Tim, do you mind Thank going first? <laughs> okay, Tim, you need to unmute yourself. Un unmute yourself again. Okay. You're good. Am I good now? Yeah. Okay. Well, Chip, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to virtually meet everyone and hear, you know, the six word stories of, of your <laughs> life. That's very difficult to do, by the way, uh, Chip. And one word that I would say that I forgot of the six words, I think I maybe used five, I think I have an extra word, would okay. be freedom, freedom. And I think that word is, uh, a, a, it's a word that doesn't exist in a lot of parts of the world and, and, and even in this country, obviously. Um, and I say that word because uh, I've done a lot of work with musicians from all over the world, of course. And then I have this, this peace ensemble, as it were, called the Universal Spirits Ensemble, which has in, in its compositional makeup, Lebanese, Afghani, Syrian, South African, Cuban, um, Japanese, Chinese. So, so it's kind of a very diverse ensemble. And the very difficult thing that I discovered um, being a white person from the United States but growing up in the Detroit area, I'm kind of being, not even thinking about race as an issue because music to me was always part of my life. My father took me to jazz clubs when I was a child in Detroit and Toledo and Cleveland. And these were just people who were playing music. It wasn't the white black thing, wasn't even an issue. It was just like great musicians. But then as I started playing more around the world and traveling and touring and going to Brazil and going to China and going to you know, various parts of the world, I started, you know, really becoming a person of the world, not necessarily as a U.S. citizen, but I sort of felt myself more of as a citizen of the world, where I really feel and still feel like I'm, I'm not, I don't feel at home anywhere, but yet I feel at home everywhere. Uh, and it's a very strange feeling to have. I guess I'm feeling closer to New York because I've been living here the longest, but it still doesn't feel really like home. And when, while working with a lot of musicians, and I'll, the, the biggest, the most striking example was working with an Israeli and a Palestinian musician. And uh, I worked with a few Israeli and Palestinian musicians. And what happened was, in fact, I did something recently at the ISPA conference in New York City. 
and I was a guest speaker as part of the arts and music for peace. <clears throat> and the Palestinian musician said, if you use the word peace, I can't be on stage with an Israeli. So even though peace is a beautiful word, it has resonating or it resonates to Palestinians wrong. And in other words, it's, it's almost become like a, 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 I hate to say the word, but like a, a very toxic meaning. So, so I said, well, what do you use instead of peace? He said, freedom. And so there's a good friend of mine who's a percussionist from Israel and he, he does, he just ran the New York City Marathon with a Palestinian musician, another musician, and they ran together with the word freedom and they did the race arm in arm all the way to the, to the finish. And so for them, he said, I can use the word freedom because if I use the word peace, my family members could get killed back home. And I, I, I just, I, you know, again, as a United States citizen, I don't think about these things, but I don't live that life. I didn't, didn't grow up with that. So I really started having to realize that how do I, as a musician, what can I do to, to in, in other words, to bring about peace, to bring about freedom, to bring about some kind of dialogue so that everyone feels included in this very difficult little planet down here. And Chip, I talked to you a little bit about this, but my, my goal has always been, of course, music, but I think music can bring the world to wherever we go in a way that, that, that people can see on stage, the world is in front of them. And I don't have to really hit anybody over the head with the talking of peace, but we can be peaceful on stage. And the thing about music that that's the most, uh, I think the beautiful, most beautiful thing about music is that our souls vibrate when we're performing. And there have even been studies by scientists and doctors who have talked about linking, you know, uh, doing scans of the brain and the heart while you're singing music, while you're listening to music and how it actually affects. So while on stage with another musician, and that's something we don't even think about is that as soon as you perform with another musician, you are connected to that soul of that person. And the audience actually feels that. And that's why live audiences still are, when they go see something live, even if it's a rock and roll concert or whatever, you're still actually connected very deeply to not only the musicians on stage, but all the people around you. So I think my best uh, sort of, uh, offering that I can do and what I'm going to try to try to do is now tour with this ensemble going into more red states than not and going to small universe small schools high schools playing you know like cafeterias if, if they don't have a performance space because a lot of a lot of people won't leave their counties where they live let alone go to the big city near with them but they may not even leave their little town so uh, and my, the, my first professional gig when I was just out of a university was with Maynard Ferguson, and that's what he did, but we didn't do it in a peace building way. We just went to every, all 50 states on a bus, getting out, setting up, playing in for high schools. <clears throat> and at that time, I didn't think about it, except that people were like amazed at the, the quality of the music, the, the, the musicianship, but also the spirit of the evening. So I feel that I would love to take groups of diverse people to various settings around the world, of course, but I think right now the United States may need this more than, well, certainly as much as anybody based on this, our divis divisiveness that we have politically. So I think that, and then going to the schools, working with young stu students from middle school, you know, let's say junior high through high school, go to the town, spend a day or two or three, and then at the end of the three days, invite some of those young people on stage with us to perform with us so that this young 13 year old girl playing the flute is on stage with an Afghani and a Syrian and a South African and sh that will change her life forever. And hopefully her parents and hopefully her grandparents and hopefully the whole community. So I feel that what I can offer is something through music and entertainment, let's say, uh, bringing about so, hope some, 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 some freedom and, and Community, community, I guess that's the next word, freedom and community. Okay, that's maybe more than five minutes, but sorry. Yeah, not much, and we'll be working on this. So if you're interested, keep in touch with either Tim or me, Abby. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks Tim for um, uh, pinching. 
I, I'm excited to go after Tim, especially because I thematic elements um, between what we do. Um, so, so I co-founded a magazine called Stranger's Guide, and we started in, we sort of, my, my partner and I um, sort of came up with the idea and really got serious about it in the end of 2016, um, you know, around the time of a certain election that everyone probably remembers. Um, and thinking about what, you know, we, we both came from journalistic backgrounds. I had been more in the investigative political um, realm of things and had moved more and more into this question of like, how do we make sustainable journalism? Because I, I felt like it was the most central threat. Uh, my partner, Kira Don, had regions, had spent a lot, a lot of time in the former Yugoslavia, in parts of Eastern Europe. Um, sort of the 90s and um, and then had moved into a more literary direction and had most recently uh, director of a magazine called Lapham's Quarterly and uh, helped Coflin Book Festival. So we had always had this idea that the best way to sort of explore complicated ideas was through the lens of place. That when you talk about station different kinds of stories, different kinds of voices, that it can challenge preconceived notions, stereotypes that somebody have. And we also were thinking a lot about the fact that, you know, there are sort of the journalistic outlets that are doing sort of, you know, excellent work, but often packages that you want to read. So, you know, my example of this is often Mother G Jones, I know it's got really important articles that I'm going to need to dig into, but man, I don't look forward to reading it. I kind of put it to one side. I sort of half-heartedly open it and, you know, begin to, to tackle it. Got something that you were excited to open, even knowing that there were going to be articles that were going to be gut punches. And so that was really the, the, for the publication Strangers Guide. But we uh, are a quarterly publication and with each guide that we do, we, we make sure first and foremost that we create an advisory board of people from the location we're covering who then help us connect to um, photographers, writers, storytellers so that we can ensure that the guide is at least 75 and usually we hit closer to 80 or 90% writers from the location we're covering. That's a critical piece to us in part because there are so few platforms now for writers to reach kind of mainstream American audiences. So we work really hard to build a lineup of writers from the location. And we also feel like it's critical to bring together pieces on different topics. So, you know, one of my favorite examples is our Lagos issue. We, Lagos is 95% writers um, from Nigeria. Thank you, Chip. Uh, thank you, Vanna, for that. Uh, look, um, but we had a fashion shoot by a fashion photographer. Um, we had a piece on monkey, uh, monkey posts, which is sort of street. We also had pieces on, you know, social movements, a feminist art collective and on kind of political struggles. There aren't really any other magazines. I had a multitude of pieces um, in, in one place. But the reason we feel like it's really important, people have ideas of what Lagos is. For most of us, we may never get to go there but getting a sense of it's more than whatever you think it is, right? And we know that that's true of any place we're from. We know that any place that we've lived is more than one headline. And yet it's really hard to communicate sometimes. And that's one of the roots of polarization is the ability to get, you know, minimize something that represents so much more. So we do um, four of them are international. One of them is typically domestic. So this year we just did Texas. Um, and again, with the mindset of trying to bring together perspectives and stories that are that are unexpected and that challenge um, stereotypes. Um, the last thing that I would say is that we, because we do this emphasis on photography, the illustrated cover, we really try to make them feel lovely. And even though a lot of the pieces in them are challenging or complicated and, and can in some cases really bring you to tears, that these are these are things you tr you sort of savor and look forward to receiving in the mail because that's a key piece too, getting people 
to open things and not just subscribe or, you know, read the headlines, but not engage. And so trying to entice people to engage is a key, a key piece of what we do that we think is pretty exciting. Um, I think I'm at my five minutes, so I can, I can stop there, but um, I'm really excited to. And to um, keep this in Texas, where um, for some reason, Abby's great grandfather when my great grandfather got off the boat in Ellis Island, Abby's great grandfather got off the boat in Houston or with some such Galveston. Place, Galveston, and they have become Texans. And so to keep it in Texas, which wasn't planned, let me turn it to Tony, who is in Plano, I believe. Um, yeah, I'm in uh, Dallas, Plano area here in Texas. And uh, gosh, I feel like I'm. Uh, so happy to be with you guys, especially some of the things that you've said have really resonated with me already. Um, so what a pleasure. Um, I do something that I thought was really unusual, but I'm finding that maybe it's not. Uh, I train yoga teachers here in Texas. I've been doing that about 10 years and practicing yoga about 16. And um, at some point, really close to the election, I, I was struggling with kind of the conflict that's happening in the world around us. And so I thought, how can I um, share some of these practices of nonviolence uh, that we do in yoga and mindfulness um, to help apply them to solving some of these conflicts? And so um, I found myself getting uh, a lot more trauma sensitive clients and noticing that there are some really useful applications of mindfulness, specifically restorative yoga, if you can get people to do it in quieting the central nervous system and expanding uh, a more peaceful frame. And that if you can cultivate that frame, although I have to say it's challenging because you have to get people to practice, then the way that they interpret events around them uh, changes and they work, um, they start to develop more concentration and more empathy or compassion. And uh, this sounds crazy, but I was doing um, ADR stuff at the same time I was doing yoga and I thought they were separate. And then I got these diversion court clients and um, a client, uh, a surgical school here, uh, UT Southwestern, and they were really working on specifically this. They were working on cultivating um, peace or less intrapersonal or an interpersonal conflict by um, using yoga and meditation techniques. And so after doing this for about a year, I woke up and I went, oh, I'm, I'm combining peace building and mindfulness. And isn't that the craziest thing that ever happened? And now that I've been doing it for a minute, I'm starting to find articles that support the underlying neurobiology of empathy and compassion and how they can be cultivated. And um, Chip has been very instrumental in sharing some of these ideas with me. There's a whole website called Rewire about rewiring the brain using these kinds of techniques. And um, I love it because it's also cross-cultural. I know sometimes people are like yoga, I don't know, it's hippie, whatever, but music, prayer, spirituality, swimming, marathons, all of that affects the way that we use our brains and not surprisingly the opposite of that social media reading your phone being super hyper focused in the front using your eyes in that way so um i also had kind of a happy moment where i realized that um, the scope of this work is not limited to the people that i that i talk to there is even though it's a very intrapersonal kind of modality I've trained like 150 yoga teachers and they're in six countries all over the world. So whoever you share these techniques with, those people have been walking around for 10 years and maybe that seed that we plant today doesn't grow in a way that you can see it. But sometimes the teachers come back after five or seven years and say, hey, listen, um, the best thing about what I'm doing in the training is I have to do yoga every day or else I'm in conflict with my family. And if I stay up with my practice, then the way that I interpret the world brings more peace for me. And so hopefully throughout 
um, my studies, I'm a new PhD student, I can find a way to document scientifically and academically these links that I, I think I'm seeing. That's my spiel. Okay, and finally, Kate, who is not a Texan, uh, will we'll talk about uh, what we're doing at, at Build Up. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great link, Tony, too. Um, so we, I wanted to focus on a specific project that we're doing at Build Up right now within, especially with this conversation, which I think is a lot centered around what's happening in the US. Uh, and just what does that mean for how we engage? And I think, Tony, this is a great bridge because you one mentioned social media and two, I think are also talking a lot about like, what does it mean to be very intentional and present in that space? Um, so what we've been doing a build up for the last four years, really since the 2016 US election is asking what role can social media play in uh, really kind of like deepening our ability to have conversations around the complex realities within the United States. Um, I kind of am trying to avoid the word healthy conversations because I feel like right now in sort of the aftermath of the election, there's been a lot of conversations around what does healthy conversations and I feel like it's like how do we hold sort of conflict in a healthy way but be able to create spaces where we can open up that conversation because I think that that leads us to a lot of the spaces where we're at now. Um, and so we really have been saying, you know, we know social media can foster the speed, scale, et cetera, sort of reaching new people as was sort of demonstrated with sort of the 2016 US election around Cambridge Analytica, um, but also sort of a lot of other actors utilizing social media in uh, an attempt to sort of manipulate or to sort of sway people's opinions. Uh, I think that, and that has a whole slew of different impacts, right? We've seen sort of intentional disinformation move into misinformation around COVID-19, for instance, or around sort of various pieces of the election. Um, I think we've seen sort of discrimination sort of happen, both in terms of the ways in which the norms that uh, different companies are sort of playing for it, but also in terms of like how sort of our narratives are being built. Um, and I think that like we see sort of consistent trauma popping up, like in response to that, where I think that like folks that are exposed to uh, divisive content or folks that are exposed to like content, well, let's just describe it as divisive, that I think that that can trigger sort of a trauma response. And I think that that can like also influence our level of polarization and sort of distancing and sort of dehumanization towards each other, but also towards some of the realities that we're experiencing there. And so we've really been asking if there's a lot of folks that are sort of saying, you know, one option is change the algorithms of the social media platforms, which I think is critical and sort of necessary and the governance and sort of everything like that. Um, I think that there's a whole other group of folks that are sort of saying, remove yourselves 100% from social media and that's the best way forward. Uh, and I think for some folks that is a very needed and sort of legitimate way forward. And I think we've been sort of asking, how do we use social media to both kind of interrupt harm um, or de-escalate conflict or promote positive examples or, uh, you know, sort of model a different set of norms or really be able to open up and explore sort of complexities, but also start to create spaces for imagination around like where else we can go together. Um, and just sort of seeing that like social media has all of these strengths of being able to reach unusual people, being able to see like how conversations evolve, um, which help us, I think, understand yeah, I mean, really just like how we are engaging as a society and a community. And so that's kind of what we've been doing with the Commons Project. Uh, Chip sort of mentioned this like lens of, I think we started this in 2016 and have been continuing it in a variety of different ways until now. And I think we've really sort of asked what are the messaging, but also the technical tools that can help us engage on social media. So if messaging is around really like, what are the words that we are saying to create a space that is not polarizing to create a space that sort of asks us to hold sort of the norms of listening or the hold space of um, full human engagement. Uh, and if the technical side of it is really about uh, what are some of the technologies that are available on social media, whether that's stuff that's built into platforms 
or stuff that we can build. So we can think about this in terms of bots and sort of like the robots of social media. We can think about this in terms of things like Facebook advertisements, or we can think about this um, in terms of really even understanding like how platforms work and really sort of saying like if hashtags, like I always talk about hashtags as public parks, partly because I'm an urban planner. So it's like my best parallel, you know, like our hashtags are kind of like where our public conversations are happening. Um, and so it's sort of asking us like, what are we talking about within our public conversations and what is sort of the nature of that conversation and how do we sort of shape that? And so over the last, to sort of wrap this up, over the last four years, we've really sort of asked like, what are the messaging and technical components that allow us and sort of challenge us to engage in sort of the polarization or towards depolarization on social media. Then I think this year, and that has looked like literally five of us having 10,000 conversations on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> so we can have a lot of conversations there about what that looks like. Uh, and this year where we're sort of asking, what does it look like to invite social media users who are really, um, I think just care a lot about like where we're at in the United States and sort of recognize how easy it is for us all to sort of like something that can be divisive or can be polarizing um, and create sort of a type of attention there, but also start to look at what can their own practice look like within their social media networks or within sort of their trusted networks look like uh, to really start to say, can we build sort of a different space than the type of polarization that a lot of us are seeing in social media, but also the type of um, polarization that we're seeing around race, racism, and white supremacy also on social media. So that's kind of what we're doing. So this year we're really sort of saying, can we invite a larger group of people in to do this with us and create kind of like time bound practices where people are really thinking about how do they engage and really actively doing their own engagement and testing out some of the messaging and technical strategies. Um, just to see how that changes our own personal experiences, but also changes the way and the norms of our relationships too. So that's what we've been doing. So we, we, we've we talked for about 45 minutes and I want to, for us to begin stop talking, but I have to admit to one teacher problem. And that is, which I've learned from my fourth grade grandson who we gave, he has read World Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements by John Hunter, which is a wonderful book if you haven't read it. Um, but he said to me one day, Grandpa, you don't like awkward silences. And, and I don't, you know, and, and I was one of those in the classroom, one of those people who really hated it when someone didn't, wasn't ready to talk right away. So I'm preparing myself now for an awkward silence because I'm gonna ask you a really professorly stupid question, which is how did what you hear resonate or not with what you are already doing as student teacher or whatever it is you do. And we've had a couple of people join since we started. So uh, I'm now ready for my awkward silence. And you can just speak, but we don't need to do the raise hand thing. I'll jump in. Oh, good. You, you, you've been through a lot of those awkward silences. Thank you, Amanda. Well, um, I think that one of the things that I end up teaching a lot about or encouraging in my classes, which are based in conflict resolution, is how you lend imagination to the problem. And what all of the presentations that were given were people lending really good imagination to the problem of peace building. And I think that, um, you know, the Beyond War Project, the 60s, the 70s, like a lot of the early peace movements were really about sort of holding up the peace sign of hopefulness without necessarily the legs underneath it to create some really um, concrete steps towards peace building. And so one of the things that I heard all of the presenters talk about is how they took their own creative vision and lent imagination to what peace building can look like as a, as a concrete and replicable and engaged model of, of moving forward toward it. So that's really exciting to me. And I especially um, always appreciate um, the two things that I always particularly appreciate are um, mentioning love, because I think love is 
way more important and way less sentimental than we often think of it. And many of you talked about that in the language of both love, connection, and care, um, and also creativity, specifically looking at music and the arts as being things that um, bring the glue of humanity back together. And these are things that I use in smaller ways, perhaps, but certainly advocate for in my in my own personal peacemaking practice as well as in my classroom. So thank you for that. Let me kick it back to you and then maybe to John as well. And then we'll talk to people who are primarily students and how Amanda, do you try to make this happen in your classroom and and especially at an urban university in one of the more complicated cities in in the country and you can almost ask the same thing for for john who is a literature teacher in also one of the more complicated though less in the news cities in the country though you are in the news today at least in, in the new york times so why don't you two try that well, in the anarchistic jurisdiction of Portland, Oregon, I can tell you, um, <laughs> see Michael smiling, um, but I think this is a moment where there's a real um, waking up around issues of social justice and a great desire for people to take action. Um, while not everyone is on the anarchistic train and not everyone is supportive of the way in which peace building is being expressed right now, it's bringing the conversation up for people, okay, well, what is nonviolence? Well, what is direct action? Well, what is peace building? What does it look like to stand up and make a difference? And so in my, both in my academic context and also in my personal context, I feel like what I do is support people in thinking creatively about what that looks like for them and how that fits into their own ideology and their own ethical frameworks. So, um, so I support students in being creative about how they interpret action. And I also support my own community and action. But part of my action is, you know, I, I'm, my big thing is feeding people. I love to feed people, but feeding people is just the um, doorway drug into conversation and connection. And so, you know, we all have different ways that we do that. And John, as a literature guy, yeah, as a, a literature guy teaching courses on literature and peace studies, I, I, I enjoyed your uh, diagram about positive peace and the, the evolution uh, in that direction, because I went through that myself. When I started teaching courses like this back in the 1980s, it was literature and war, and it was all war uh, and anti-war stuff. But I once ended, this is how stupid I was, I once ended a course with Dr. Strangelove as the final text, probably the worst final text you could imagine for a course on, on uh, the war and with the idea of trying to encourage peace. Well, I learned something from that and tried to give at least as much emphasis, really much more over the years to peacemaking rather than just anti-war stuff. So, uh, so that was one lesson, but uh, and since retiring, uh, I've become involved with Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Cincinnati. And uh, that turns out to be a good continuation of peace studies work because we, when we tell the story of Harriet, it's the story of a conscience evolving, somebody who didn't really have a great interest in the abolitionist cause, was a colonizationist, but turned into an abolitionist in her 18 years in Cincinnati. So we can talk about it that way. She found her voice as a writer at the same time she was forming her conscience and thinking beyond her father's perspectives on things uh, and the popular perspectives on things in Cincinnati, which was a very uh, pro-slavery town in the years that Harriet was there. So I don't know if that exactly addresses the question, but uh, certainly, uh, and the whole telling Harriet story has certainly engaged me in the past few years since I retired. Anyone else? Well, I'll just say that in addition to being a student, uh, I also teach as an adjunct at Elizabethtown College, which is here oh. in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and um, uh, I'm teaching a course in the spring. 
I think that's what season we're going into right now. <laughs> oh, losing track of the months. Uh, called Artistic Peace Building. Um, it was taught two years ago by uh, Kevin Shorner Johnson, who, and I'll be co-teaching it with Kevin this spring. He has started a music and peace building program uh, at E-Town. Um, and uh, two years ago, it was co-taught with John Rudy, who some of you may know um, through yeah, I know John. of ways. So anyway, I'm going to be teaching that. And I said to, to Kevin, I don't bring anything artistic. Like, that is not me. But um, it's really helpful to hear uh, through through all the stories that you all are sharing, um, I think that the creativity in peace building is more than just like art, you know? I mean, music and art and literature and design are really important elements, but just, uh, I'm, in, I'm excited to think through ways to, to encourage students to think about the act of peace building as creativity um, and, and not just as art as a tool, um, but actually that that can be the outcome. Um, so it's just, it's just an interest. I, I appreciate this conversation. I wasn't even expecting that to be what I got out of this conversation. I came to support Tony, um, who is in my cohort, um, and to hear some interesting, interesting conversations. So I'm excited also to be, to be involved in conversation that will be very useful to what I will be walking into teaching in the spring. So thank you. Other ideas? Well, I have one. Again, I hate awkward silences. Um, I think Tim was going to go, and Tim, you were on. One of the things that, that that John said grabbed me about showing Dr. Strangelove, which I actually, the last time I saw it, it was shown to a bunch of Marines who I was helping train who were going to be deployed into conflict zones, and how can you avoid the end of Dr. Strangelove, which is why the colonel was showing it to them. But um, I have a friend who, Abby, you may know, Larry Wright. He's a, yeah. He's, a writer, he's, yeah. He's in Austin. He wrote this book. I was sort of, we had met him as he was beginning to work on it. He had sat in on discussions with, with the Pentagon about the threat of pandemics. And he couldn't cover that as a New Yorker journalist. So he decided to write a novel, which he's done before. And the, the novel called The End of October came out in April. And it's essentially, he takes all the science about pandemics, designs one that is significantly worse than COVID and spreads considerably more virally. And it was so depressing, I couldn't read it past the middle for, I started reading it when it came out in April, I finally was able to pick it up in, in August. And in some ways, you know, what George Lopez called Gloom and Doom 101 is um, something that we have done as a field. And, and, you know, maybe I'm just too old to realize that my younger colleagues have gotten past that and we're trying to talk constructed solutions. Abby, you look pensive. Um, I, will, I think Tim is has something to say. Go ahead. I don't. No, I mean, um, everyone's saying such um, beautiful you know, things. And it's like, I, I, all, there's so many connections with everyone's uh, ideas and, and their strengths. And it's, it's, it's funny how we're so similar in so many ways. And I was just thinking, I had a conversation today with a relative who's talking about uh, opinion. You know, well, that's your opinion. And I think that, you know, we, there's this whole idea about the United States becoming the democratic socialist part, you know, like the, the, the word socialism is being put out there in this. I think the idea in the United States anyway, from what I, because I travel so much in other parts of the world, we are such a we society or, I'm sorry, we're such a me society that everyone's so concerned about themselves. You know, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement happened. And what is the first thing that white people do is they say, well, all lives matter. So it's almost, it's, it's the, the, the thing we're like, excuse me, 400 years <laughs> of being abused for the first time maybe ever, well, Martin Luther King period, but we are now at the place where we're nearly back at the 60s. At a first time where there's a possibility of listening, 
I don't think that that's the, that's one of the biggest problems that people are not willing to actually listen. And if they do listen, they are more interested in listening to a YouTube channel from some obscure person as facts than perhaps a reliable source. So when I was talking to one of my cousins today about you know what he's what his thoughts are, and he goes, "Well, Tim, those are just your opinions." I said, "Yes, that's you're right. We we, we all have our opinions, but if if these opinions are not based on any kind of facts or facts that are so I'm just thinking about, I, I forget who was saying, who was, who, it maybe it's funny the Texas connection because I went to school in North Texas. So, so there's three of us that have a Texas connection, it's weird. Um, but like, how, how can we, you know, us, uh, you know, get beyond the me phase and really consider other people's, I hate to say the, even the word opinion because opinion is so, <laughs> it's, it's still a me situation, my opinion, I feel, you know, how do we become more of a we society? Okay. So I, I, I wanna bounce off that and then throw it to Abby, Tim, and in two ways. One is a, a one of my grad school professors is also one of Abby's dad's grad school professors, Bob Putnam has just done a book called The Upswing in which he talks about exactly that, the shift from an, a, a me to a we culture that produces more egalitarianism in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then how that has evaporated in his adult lifetime, my adult lifetime. Um, and the other thing that I'll let, let Abby talk about is that I would maybe it might make sense for you to talk a little bit about the We Day folks you introduced me to that I haven't followed up on. Abby, you were going to say something. Oh, no, um, well, I was just going to make a sort of observation, especially listening to um, to, to Tony, Tim, and, and Kate, um, and then some, something that Amanda said. I mean, it does seem to me to what degree sort of the decreasing attention span of kind of Americans as, you know, as a result of the internet, as a result of, you know, social media, et cetera, makes, makes sort of peace building more complicated, right? Because I, I feel as though, you know, when Tim was talking about the experience of hearing live music or when Tony was talking about like, you know, yoga, yoga practices and, and what they do for people, it seems to me like a, a big piece of that is the ability to, to focus on one thing for a period of time. You don't go to a live music show. I mean, some people do, but it's unusual that you would actually be trying to multitask in any serious capacity at a live music show. It, it's difficult to, you know, it's really not allowed to multitask while you're like trying to, you know, have a yoga practice, like when you're in that practice, right? Um, and and I think it's really interesting. I was reading, there's a New Yorker article today talking about this TV show um, and sort of calling it ambient television. That, that increasingly there are these TV shows on Netflix that are really designed not so much for you to have an experience, you know, and, a, and sort of an encounter in the way that TV, you know, has offered these powerful ways to encounter other realities, other perspectives, but instead is kind of meant to be ambient noise that deadens your kind of thought process, right? That you sort of, you know, things are really hard. It's hard to think about kind of the reality we're living in. So I'll put this on in the background so I don't have to think while I do the laundry or while I do X and Y and Z. And and I'm curious, Kate, to, to maybe not to put you on the spot, but you know, for for us at Strangers Guide, like one of the reasons I think what we do has the ability to be um, efficacious is because it's a print product. And so when you see the articles, you don't have a filter bubble, right? The articles are by kind of design trying to put together things that are slightly discordant and challenge you to to make those connections to say, oh, whoa, there, there's this and there's this. And we struggle as a, as a company to build to build um, experiences like that online. Um, and we've, you know, come up with some creative solutions. But I'm curious, as someone whose work has been explicitly in the in the digital space, how you elongate um, people people's attention span, right? Because it, it feels like that's that's the real limiting factor to have a, an encounter, or a conversation, or expose yourself. You know, like what Tim is saying. Feel, it feels like that's curtailed when you're sort of, you know, you have eight different tabs open and you're playing a video game while you're listening to the YouTube video while you're texting with a friend. Um, and I have a 16 year old, so I, I've seen, I've seen this up close right? and it's in some ways amazing. Um, but in other ways, I, I feel like extremely limiting and, and sort of one of the more central challenges to, to making progress in, in the ways that so many people just talked about. Tony. 
What uh, Tim and Abby were saying reminds me of another concept that, that I use a lot in yoga and it's also applicable for peace building. We have this duality oneness concept and that's very much applicable to what everyone is talking about. And the hard part about um, online media is that it's always dual. You're always an individual, even if you're in conversation. I mean, it's really hard for us even to be talking as a group. It's always one person talking at a time even on Zoom. And so I would say any activity that we do with a large group of people who are in unison, like a concert or like a church service, we're encouraging people to be in a oneness state. And that is what really enhances compassion and empathy. And I think it's really a huge challenge right now because we're all so isolated. Um, and online media seems like such an amazing tool. So I would, I would say, yeah, Abby, how do we get to that space where um, we're together and, and encouraging activities where people are actually together when this is over? In, in some ways, I hear you all saying something that has been central to my work for forever. And, and that is for any of these initiatives to work, they have to grab people emotionally. And in at least in my part of the peace building world, we, we, we're now having this fetish to local peace building. And, and that people on the ground know what they need better than somebody flying in from Washington or Cambridge or even Austin would, would do. And, you know, when I hear stories like John talk about the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, which I'd never heard of in Cincinnati, um, to, it, it suggests to me that things will be different in Cincinnati than they'll be in Oberlin, where I spend an awful lot of time, and they'll be different in in Austin. Um, they'll they'll be different in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. Um, but there has to be this kind of of connection. And one of the things that that has grabbed me about um, Abby's work and Tony's work but I'm gonna kick it back to Tim, is, is the, the making of this non-rational, non-left brain um, connection. And Tim, I'd like you to talk about both the We Day and I hadn't realized that you had gone to North Texas with Bob, but talk about what Bob did and how actually we got to know each other and how that can be sort of a metaphor for the kinds of things you're talking about. Because the We Day folks really don't talk about peace building at all, but that's what they're doing. You're on mute still, Tim. Okay, is that better? Better. Okay. The We Day, which I invite anyone to check out, it was uh, created by these two brothers in Canada. And it has become like a, you know, we're thousands of children, children like young uh, high school, mostly high school students show up. But the idea is that somebody has a, a passion or an idea that they want to, you know, become, it could, their thing could be, you know, human rights or, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be any topic that, a, that a young person is interested in doing and they have to be focused on that for a year. And so all over the country and all over the world, people do this. And then, and their sort of their gift, the two brothers put together these, I would hate to say concerts, but these events at like Madison Square Gardens and the LA Forum. I mean, you know, 20,000 teens there who have all spent a year of their life, you know, really for the homeless or whatever their, whatever their, uh, their idea is to change the world in a positive way. Then they all show up in these, these, these huge events and on stage, then they have kind of peace builders, or you know, it could be the you know the the queen of this country, or the, this entertainer, or this 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 philosopher, or this this writer. So they have these to these talks, and 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 it's pretty amazing uh, happening, let's say, and it, it definitely changes, you know. And so just Google We Day, and you'll see how it'll certainly be 
better than my description of it, which is not that good. But so I met the brothers and, and they invited me to, uh, to an event <clears throat> in Toronto when I was there. And they wanted to do some work with me. And then hopefully th this group that I'm talking about, maybe one of these days will will we'll eventually perform there. But um, I don't know, it's funny hearing all this stuff about, you know, cause I avoid anything online as much as possible. Like I, I don't even, I know I should professionally use Facebook and I should do this. And my, my one of my 17 year old twins set up my Instagram account, you know, but I don't do anything. I when I look online, I'm, I'm really, it, for me, it distracts me from, first of all, my focus on what I want to do, which is be mindful and, and composing music and then to, to do it. But it feels like it's just like a barrage of like, blah, it, it, it's, it's massive amounts of, of information. Some of it good, most of it not good. And I think that, you know, the, the United States more than anybody is like, we, we're, we're a country of mediocrity and that rises somehow that, you know, like the, the, the most baseline, okay, I hate to say the word McDonald's, but like that becomes, you know, our, our life. So anyway, um, I, I just hearing everybody talking, I'm just thinking about this, uh, this, this, this tour that I would like to do. And by the way, that I want to do it within a green context so that there's going to be three groups touring or are traveling by train by electric cars. And so they have to arrive in a way that's, that's, you know, good for the planet. So that it also talks about, you know, uh, you know, organic, you know, foods, you know, so, so that all of these things, and, and it would be great to have yoga involved and like, you know, really, you know, social media. And there's so many ways I think that could be really quite be beautiful to, to, to like, you know, uh, uh, to, to work with, with, I'm just, you know, this is a, I'm, I'm thrilled and excited to, to pop the possibility of like, you know, okay, let's, if it weren't for this pandemic, you know, it would be like, let's start tomorrow. But I guess starting now would be good. My feeling is like next fall, you know, like a year, like a September of 2021, maybe hopefully with any knock on wood, with any luck, we'll have the ability to do more and in person. And it would be great to like actually see friends and hug them. And you know, it would be a beautiful thing to share. Yeah, okay. And talk a little bit about what Bob did. Oh, well, Bob, Bob Belden, who was just an incredible human being, very intelligent. He was, Bob was always the smartest guy in the room. He, he was one of those people where he know, he, he, he passed away, knew a lot about everything. He just was a, a, kind of a genius. And we would, we would have many, we lived each other, next to each other on 87th Street in New York City. And we would have breakfast and lunch and often dinner together like for years debating and talking about politics and religion and philosophy. And, and at one point, Bob wrote a beautiful piece of music um, based on the Black Dahlia novel. Uh, and the, the, a true story in Los Angeles, the unsolved murder. But he wrote this music and a friend of Chips and mine, um, Dick O'Neill, loved jazz, loved the piece and contacted Bob and, and of course Dick was part of the Pentagon for many years and said, I'm, I'm in town, I love your music, would you like to get together? And that encounter of Dick meeting Bob didn't realize that Bob's level of interest and in, similar to what we're all talking about, actually fast forwarding four or five years, Bob was able to, through, with the help of Dick and a number of people, bring a musical group to Iran for the first time since the hostage crisis in 79. So that happened through music. And, and, and I, don't know if, I don't know if it's any coincidence that it was also the same time that we created the, the nuclear talks with Iran. So that was an American group of jazz musicians going and performing and working with young students. And Bob was so thrilled with that. And he was so excited, he came back he gave a talk at the Alliance for Peace Building, their annual meeting, went back to his apartment in New York and died of a heart attack. So it was tragic, but that's through Bob is how I met Chip and Dick and um, the Alliance for Peace Building folks, uh, Melanie Greenberg. So um, it, it, it's something that I've been wanting to do for 30 years of my life, but now it seems like, okay, there's no, I, I, this is what, my, like all of my career has led to the point where this is what I, I have to do. Like for me, I feel like if I'm going to stay in this country, which I don't necessarily want to, but I feel like I, I'm here. So I have to do something. I have to make a difference, try something. And 
through each little community all over the, I feel changing one little person, as you mentioned with, with yoga, you teach one person and that, that seed is going to, it's the trees will grow. So, so for those of you who aren't part of my mafia, in other words, I didn't ask you to speak today. What advice do you give us? You know, I mean, I'm clearly at a point in my life where I can do, I wake up every morning and I decide what I'm going to do that day. And I see my job now as how do I build support for peace building in any way possible that touches people's lives. And, and as Tim says, not the normal suspect not the people who um, I want to be able to reach the people who voted for Trump and are not part of the Proud Boys. I want to reach the people that I played football with in high school, who when we went to my 50th high school reunion, it was clear that they were all going to vote for Trump or one of the other Republicans. Uh, and they blame people like me for the problems that our country faces. So I wanna expand beyond the usual suspects. And um, we've done this at, at the Build Peace Conference, uh, a session like this, we'll do another one like this at AFP, but we, we need input from other people. You know, what do you think we can do to be useful, especially, I mean, my stereotype of, of PJSA is that it's composed mostly of academics who are more to the left than I am, at least now. So I'm, uh, I'm willing, uh, yeah, I'm eager to hear, um, you know, and especially, but poor Michael has 11 children, uh, but I can talk with him anytime. But for the rest of you, uh, what would you suggest that we do in the 11 minutes we have left. Oh, another awkward silence. I'll say just for a second, assuming like everyone will stay quiet in my house, um, that like one of the most interesting things for me that I've been trying to work on the last few years is to provide uh, data. Right, to gather data which other people need to make uh, more informed policy or better arguments or more informed decisions in, in a number of ways. One second. So I've been focusing on the way in which political violence is prosecuted, which kind of crosses into this like terrorism rhetoric area and this criminalization of protest area. But in general, one of the things I think we really need to do is invest in the infrastructure of data and measurement because I think a lot of these things that we work on are very difficult to measure. So for example, you know, a metric for measuring polarization you know, can be developed and, and has been developed, but these sorts of data points we need to see if what we're doing is effective uh, on a policy level, I think is often lacking. And so that to me has been, it, it took me a long time to kind of get to that point, but that to me is really what I think I want to be working on. I'm going to get into my charger, please. Thanks. And so, Kate, one of the things I was planning to do over the course of this weekend was to put Michael in touch with you all. So, Amanda, you, you seem to have an eager hand trying to go up. Uh, no, but I think Wim was going to say something. Oh, uh, uh, hi. Yeah, um... You're Wim. Hi. Yeah, um, your name just appeared. I saw you had appeared, and I, I don't think I know you. I'm Chip, by the way. Um... Go ahead. I'm part of the, uh, I was part of the conference planning committee, but I don't think that I actually emailed you. I was excited about this panel and got distracted. So I apologize for being somewhat tardy. That's okay. Um, you, have, I, you have a microphone. You have a cool microphone. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make a, a voice for Zoom. Um, <laughs> I can't do anything about what I actually sound like, but I do want to, you know, come in clear, but um. But I think you asked a really important question. And what's remarkable is I'm actually more used to hearing it from students than, you know, um, experts. Um, Gray hairs. But I, I think in some ways that the answer should be the same. Um, 
and that is in, in, at some level that I just keep telling people the wisdom my father gave to me when I was in my lowest point. I, I worked in Sri Lanka after the 2004 tsunami. And, you know, it was a complex humanitarian disaster where you had significant casualties, damage, destruction, and um, it kind of put the war efforts between the, the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam and the government of Sri Lanka on hold. But at, after about a year, um, you know, like literally in December of the following year, things were escalating. And I wrote everybody I could ask, um, you know, for wisdom and support and so forth. Um, and I, I received it in a lot of different ways. Uh, Tom Hastings, one of Amanda's colleagues in Portland said, you know, like it was easy to go to jail being an activist. Like um, the work I was doing was the hard stuff. And uh, but my father wrote to me with this paraphrase of Mother Teresa. It's not a matter of doing great things, but doing small things with great love. And and I, I tell my students that, like, if they just focus on the things that they can do and the things that they can do well, that is the way we make the world a better place. So, I mean, I, I have no, no doubts that you everybody here can accomplish big things, but we don't necessarily have to be focused on that. And so the second part um, is Dan Savage, who he writes an advice column that gets syndicated, but he it's basically, it's the advice guide for queers. I mean, non-queers can take a lot out of it, but he, he wrote this column earlier this week. Somebody's like, I'm out, everybody knows I'm out and my parents voted for Trump. Like, what do I do, right? Like here, here's the embodiment of everything that opposes everything about somebody's identity. And, you know, like they love their parents but how could their parents do this? And Dan Savages is like, well, it's who I am has never stopped my parents from voting against my oppression or sorry, voting for my oppression, you know, and he gives like George W. Bush as an example, and he just goes on and on and on. But, but I think that's, that's the other part of what I'd say is the target is maybe it's not all right thinking people who are not proud boys, but who are the people that you're close to that you can connect with you're right. Who are the people in your proximity that you can reach out to that you're already friends with, but have the deeper conversations with those people um, and, and do the storytelling like uh, um, Amanda Byron here, like she teaches me so much about the need, importance and role of storytelling. And when and when we connect to people through our stories or when we break bread together, you know, um, instead of trying to make the argument, but just sharing the story. And I, th I think everybody was doing a good job of that. So I would just kind of go back to the first part. If you've got a good story and you're a good storyteller, just keep, keep sharing that. I don't know. I think I took more time than I meant to for answering that question, but that's kind of my thinking right now. As we head toward an end, I want to throw out one other name because I'm having those same experiences of stories grabbing. So we were watching the news hour on April 29th and there and Judy Woodruff introduced someone I'd never heard of named Kelly Corrigan, who is a writer and in she did one of those brief but spectacular three minute things on the news hour, which I normally hate. And it was just how you as she Kelly puts it how you get to a crisis, you can't see your way out, but you take a step back and you figure out how I'm going to nail it, and I do, and it's two and a half minutes, 300 words of video, which the PBS people did a lot of great stuff with, and I, I discovered this person, Kelly Corrigan, who is 
an incredible storyteller. She has now as a podcast in which she interviews women of her generation, you know, late 40s, early 50s, who are embodying racial justice. She had a three-part series on, on PBS a few weeks ago in which she interviewed, among others, Brian Stevenson, who's done a, a tremendous work on lynching. And, and so there are these stories out there uh, and there are these wonderful storytellers, but what I hear from women, and I, and I hear it from, my, from students too, is that our stories have the, can have that same impact. You know, I mean, the Bob Belden story is just, you know, it, it brings tears to the eyes of people when, when you tell it to them or, um, and so this friend that that got Bob to, to Iran and Tim and I both know, and Abby just had an email conversation with, um, Dick says, never try to have counter arguments with someone. Never try to debate them on their terms, because once you've done that, you've accepted their frame. Present the alternative. Present your version of the story. And I'm going to, Amanda, because you, you started this, I'm going to give you the last word. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for your contributions today. It's been a really rich conversation, and I hope everyone leaves with at least a taste of inspiration, if not some um, opportunities for collaboration. Um, the, th the, t the focus that I want to tie us together with is this focus of bridge building. And Chip, you set us up for that beautifully, because I think there are Portland is the city of bridges. We have many different bridges. And I've been using that metaphor a lot this week to talk to students about how and um, how we can build bridges over the divide that we experience right now, not just politically, not just socially, but ideologically. Um, moving from the me to the we is a great sort of capture for the various different kinds of divisions that we have, because they all seem to be kind of based in that dichotomy. And so um, I found some great images of the Portland bridges to show the diversity and, and nature of each of the different bridges that run through the middle of downtown. I don't know, Wim, how many do we have? Like six, 10, something, a lot. <laughs> you seem like someone who would know this better than I do because you fetishize Portland. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, wonderful graphics just to show that there's no one right way to build the bridge, but many different, you know, ways that we can bring our own skill sets and our own knowledge base and our own passion to that process. And so I encourage all of you to use even groups like this, even on Zoom on the internet, you know, here we have this opportunity. I've just opened up like 20 tabs on my phone from all of the great resources that you all have been sharing about different things that I can um, engage with and maybe bridge back with you in future conversations about how these things um, may, how I might be able to lend um, some of the, uh, some of the structure, the architecture to the bridges that we might collectively build. So that's my closing comment. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you all. for bringing this together. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to end the recording now. Um, just as a reminder for.